Hello and welcome to the Learning College. My name is Alex Linder and you can find this and everything we record at vnnforum.com. I also post links at pieville.net and at kirksvilletoday.com. Today we're going to do 200 years together of Rus Russo-Jewish history of Alexander Solzhenitsyn. We're going to do chapter 20. It's a short chapter, only about 10 pages, so this will be shorter than usual. And it is called Chapter 20 in the Camps of the Gulag. And the way they translate Gulag, G U L, all caps, and then A G. So, Chapter 20 in the Camps of the Gulag, and I believe this is, let me check which number recording this is 32. Chapter 20, In the Camps of the Gulag, begin page 652, and like I said, it runs up to a little over 660, I think. If I haven't been there, hadn't been there, he might have said, it wouldn't be possible for me to compose this chapter, Camps of the Gulag, in the Camps of the Gulag. Of course, he wrote Gulag Archipelago, his most famous work. Before the camps, I thought that Quote, one should not notice nationalities, unquote, that there are no nationalities. There is only humankind. Now, where would he get that idea, being a Christian? But when you are sent into the camp, you find out. If you are of a lucky nationality, then you are a fortunate man. You are provided for. It's like joining a gang, almost. You have survived. But if you are of a common nationality versus a lucky nationality, well then, no offense, dot, dot, dot. Because nationality is perhaps the most important trait that gives a prisoner a chance to be picked into the life-saving corps of quote-unquote idiots, translator note, from Russian predio, predio, Yorick, something like that. I can pronounce Cyrillic a little bit. Anyway, that's the word he's using for idiots. A fool or idiot. That would be pre, prid, pretty, pretty rock, something like that. Pretty rock, some similar to that, is idiots. Fool or idiot. This is an inmate slang term to denote other inmates who didn't do common labor, but managed to obtain positions with easy duties, usually pretending to be incapable of doing hard work because of poor health. Nationality is perhaps the most important trait that gives a prisoner a chance to be picked into the life-saving corps of idiots. Every experienced camp inmate can confirm that ethnic proportions among idiots were very different from those in the general camp population. Indeed, there were virtually no prebalts among idiots, P-R-I-B-A-L-T-S, regardless of their actual number in the camp, and there were many of them. There were always Russians, of course, but in incomparably smaller proportion than in the camp on average, and those were often selected from orthodox members of the party. On the other hand, some others were noticeably concentrated. Jews, Georgians, Armenians, and Azeris also ended in higher proportions, and to some extent, Caucasian mountaineers also. Certainly none of them can be blamed for that. Every nation in the Gulag, and again, it's a Russian empire, and the empire is when you have more than one nation in the same space. Every nation in the Gulag did its best crawling to survival, and the smaller and nimbler it was, the easier it was to accomplish. And among Russians, the very last nation in, quote, their own Russian camps, like they were in the German Kriegsgefangenen lagers, the German war prisoners' camps. So in their own camps, they were treated the worst, basically. Yet it is not us who could have, been, who could have blamed them, but it is they... Armenians, Georgians, Highlanders, who would have been in their right to ask us, why did you establish these camps? Why do you force us to live in your state? Do not hold us and we will not land here and occupy these such attractive, idiotic positions. But while we are your prisoners, a la guerre comme la guerre, 
I guess that means uh, all's fair in war. But what about Jews? For fate interwove Russians and Jews, perhaps forever, which is why this book is being written. Again, that's nutty. No, fate does not. Fate, fate isn't a thing, and it, there is no necessary interweaving. What you need to do is at the least segregate if you can't exterminate. Before that, before this very line, there will be readers who have been in the camps and who haven't been and who will be quick to contest the truth of what I say here. They will claim that many Jews were forced to take part in common italics labor activities, common labor activities in Jewish participation is the question. They will deny that there were camps where Jews were the majority among idiots, those with the easy position. They will indignantly reject that nations in the camps were helping each other selectively and therefore at the expense of others deny national competition within the camps. Some others will not consider themselves as distinct Jews, quote unquote, at all, perceiving themselves as Russians and everything else. Besides, even if there was overrepresentation of Jews on key camp positions, it was absolutely unpremeditated, wasn't it? The selection was exclusively based on merit and personal talents and abilities to do business. Well, who is to blame if Russians lack business talents? There will also be those who will passionately assert directly the opposite, that it was Jews who suffered worst in the camps. This is exactly how it is understood in the West. In Soviet camps, nobody suffered as badly as Jews. Among the letters from readers of Ivan Denisovich, A Day on the Life of Ivan Denisovich, his short novel he wrote that's probably his best work, I think, there was one from an anonymous Jew, quote, You have met innocent Jews who languished in camps with you, and you obviously not at once witnessed their suffering and persecution. They endured double oppression, imprisonment, and enmity from the rest of the inmates. Tell us about these people. And if I wish to generalize italics, and state that the life of Jews in the camps was especially difficult, then I would be allowed to do so, and wouldn't be peppered with admonitions for unjust ethnic generalizations. So it's fine, and they'll promote you if you say that Jews uniquely suffer. But if you tell the truth, they want to suppress you. But in the camps where I was imprisoned, says Solzhenitsyn, it was the other way around. The life of the Jews, to the extent of possible generalization, was easier. Jews had it easier in the camps, he says. Simon Badash, my campmate from Ekibastuz, recounts in his memoirs how he had managed to settle, later in a camp at Norilsk, in the medical unit. Max Minz asked a radiologist, Laszlo Newsbaum, to solicit for Badash before a free head of the unit. He was accepted, but Badash at least finished three years of medical school before imprisonment. Compare that with other nurses. Genkin, Gorlik, Gurevich, like one of my pals, L. Kapolev from Unzlag, who never before in their lives had anything to do with medicine. And I guess, yes, they, yet they got the idiot position. Some people absolutely seriously write like this. A. Belenkov, quote, was thrown into the most despicable category of idiots. And I am tempted to inappropriately add, and languishers, here, though the, quote, languishers were the social antipodes of idiots, and Belenkoff never was among the languishers. To be thrown into the group of idiots, what an expression, like they thrown into the briar patch, exactly where they wanted to be. To be diminished by being accepted into the ranks of gentlemen. He's saying that as an uh, analogy. And here goes the justification. To dig soil? But at the age of 23, he not only never did it, he never saw a shovel in his life. Well, then he had no other choice but to become an idiot. Or read what Levitin Krasnov wrote about one Pinsky, a literature expert, that he was a nurse in the camp, which means that he, on the camp scale, has adhered well. However, Levitin presents this as an example of the greatest humiliation possible for a professor of the humanities. Or take Prisoner, a prisoner who survived, Lev Razgon, a journalist, and not a medic at all, who was heavily published afterwards, R-A-Z-G-O-N. But from his story in Ogonek, O-G-O-N-E-K, 1988, we find that he used to be a medic in the camp's medical unit and, moreover, an unescorted, italics, medic. From other, 
stories, we can figure out that he also worked as a senior controller at a horrible timber logging station, but there is not a single story from which we can conclude that he ever participated in common italics labor. So the Jews got privileged positions, says Solzhenitsyn, and that is a fair generalization in the Gulag comps. Or a story of Frank Dickler, D-I-K-L-E-R, a Jew from faraway Brazil. He was in prison and couldn't speak Russian, of course, and guess what? He had pull in the camp, and he has became a chief of the medical unit's kitchen, a truly magnificent treasure, because you get, might get enough to eat. Or Alexander Voronel, who was a, quote, political youngster when he landed in the camps, says that immediately after getting in the camp, he was, quote, readily assisted by other Jewish inmates who had not a slightest idea about my political views, unquote. So race is thicker than politics. A Jewish inmate responsible for running the bathhouse, a very important idiot as well, has spotted him instantly and ordered him to come if he needs any help. A Jew from prisoner security, also an idiot, told another Jew, a brigadier, quote, there are two Jewish guys, Hakim, don't allow them to get in trouble. And the brigadier gave them strong protection. Quote, other thieves, especially elders, approached him. You are so right, Hakim. You support your own kin. Yet we Russians are like wolves to each other. And let's not forget that even during camp imprisonment, by virtue of a common stereotype regarding all Jews as businessmen, many of them were getting commercial offer offers, sometimes even when they didn't actively look for such enterprises. Take, for instance, M. Hafez. He emphatically notes, quote, What a pity that I can't describe you those camp situations. There are so many rich, beautiful stories. However, the ethical code of a, quote, reliable Jew, unquote, seals my mouth. You know even the smallest commercial secrets should be kept forever. That's the law of the tribe. A. Let Ani Bernstein, one of my witnesses from Archipelago, thinks that he managed to survive in the camps only because in times of hardship he asked the Jews for help and that the Jews, judging by his last name and nimble manners, mistook him for their tribesmen and always provided assistance. He says that in all his camps, Jews always constituted the upper crust and that the most important free employees were also Jews. Shulman, head of special department. Greenberg, head of camp station. Kegels, chief mechanic of the factory. And according to his recollections, they also preferred to select Jewish inmates to staff their units. This particular Jewish national contract between free bosses and inmates is impossible to overlook. A free Jew was not so stupid to actually see an, quote, enemy of the people, unquote, or an evil character praying on, quote, the people's property, unquote, in an imprisoned Jew, unlike what a dumb-headed Russian saw in another Russian. He, in the first place, saw a suffering tribesmen, and I praise them for this sobriety. Those who know about terrific Jewish mutual supportiveness, especially exacerbated by mass deaths of Jews under Hitler, would understand that a free Jewish boss simply could not indifferently watch Jewish prisoners flounder in starvation and die and not help. But I am unable to imagine a free Russian employee who would save and promote his fellow Russian prisoners to the privileged positions only because of their nationality. Though we have lost 15 millions during collectivization, we are still numerous. You can't care about everyone, and nobody would even think about it. So, again, the lack of racial loyalty among whites contrasted with the race complete tribal loyalty of Jews. Sometimes, when such a team of Jewish inmates smoothly bands together and, being no longer impeded by the ferocious struggle for survival, they can engage in extraordinary activities. An engineer named Abram Zisman tells us, quote, In Novo Archangelsk camp, in our spare time, we decided to count how many Jewish pogroms occurred over the course of Russian history. We managed to excite the curiosity of our camp command of this question. They had a peaceful attitude towards us. The Naklog, or camp commander, was Captain Gremin N. Gershel, a Jew, a son of a tailor from Zlobin. He sent an inquiry to the archives of the former Interior Department, requesting the necessary information, and after eight months we received an official reply that 76 Jewish pogroms occurred from 1811 to 1917 on the territory of Russia, 
with the number of victims estimated at approximately 3,000. That is, the total number of those who suffered in any way, not necessarily killed. The author reminds us that during one six-month period in medieval Spain, more than 20,000 Jews were killed. Maybe, maybe, he's a little too unsuspicious about Jew numbers, especially in Germany and also in Spain. A plot-like atmosphere emanates from the recollections of Joseph Berger, a communist, about a highly placed snitch, Lev Ilyich Injir, a former Menshevik, arrested in 1930. He immediately began collaborating with the GPU, fearing reprisals against his family and the loss of his apartment in the center of Moscow. He, quote, helped to prepare the Menshevik trial of 1931, falsely testified against his best friends, was absolved and immediately appointed as a chief accountant of Belomorstroy. During the Yizhov Shina, he was a chief accountant of the Gulag, quote, enjoying the complete trust of his superiors and with connections to the very top NKVD officials. Injir recalled one, quote, Jewish NKVD veteran who interlarded his words with aphorisms from the Talmud. He was arrested later again, this time in the wave of anti yizhov purges, Y-E-Z-H-O-V. However, Injir's former colleagues from the Gulag favorably arranged his imprisonment. However, at this point, he turned into an explicit, quote, snitch and provocateur, and other inmates suspected that the plentiful parcels he received was receiving were not from his relatives, but directly from the third department. Nevertheless, later in 1953, in the Taishet camp, he was sentenced to an additional jail term, this time being accused of Trotskyism and of concealing his, quote, sympathies for the state of Israel, unquote, from the third department. Of worldwide infamy, Bel Balag, B-E-L-B-A-L-L-A-G. Belbalag absorbed hundreds of thousands of Russian, Ukrainian, and Middle Asian peasants between 1931 and 1932. Opening a newspaper issue from August 1933, dedicated to the completion of the canal between White and Baltic Seas, we find a list of awardees. Lower-ranking orders and medals were awarded to concreter, concreters, steel fixers, etc., but the highest degree of decoration the Order of Lenin was awarded to eight men only, and we can see large photographs of each. Only two of them were actual engineers. The rest were the chief commanders of the canal, canal according to Stalin's understanding of personal contribution. And whom do we see here? Genrik Yagoda, head of the NKVD. Matvey Berman, head of Gulag. Seaman Firin, F-I-R-I-N, commander of the Bell. Both lag. By that time, he was already commander of the Demit Lag, where the story will repeat itself later. Lazar Kogan, head of construction, later he will serve the same function at Volgo Canal. Jacob Rappaport, deputy head of construction. Naftali Frankel, chief manager of the labor force of Bello Morstroy. And the evil demon of the whole archipelago, Naftali Frankel. Now, you're not really familiar with these. As these are equivalent to like Heinrich Himmler, etc. You know, you've heard of Himmler. You've heard of the top 20, 50 Nazis, but you've never heard of these Russians. Naftali Frankel. He says, the architect, the evil demon of the whole archipelago, Gulag archipelago. And all their portraits were enlarged and reprinted again in the solemnly shameful book, Bello Moro Canal, a book of huge scriptural size, like some revelation anticipating the advent of the millenarian kingdom. And then I reproduced these six portraits of villains in Archipelago, Gulag Archipelago, borrowing them from their own exhibition and without any prior editing, showing everybody who was originally displayed. Oh my God, what a worldwide rage has surged. How dared I, this anti-Semitism of showing the Jews who tortured and murdered the Russian peasants and people using their own materials where they were bragging about it and giving them medals. I am branded and screwed as an anti-Semite. At best, to reproduce these portraits was, quote, national egotism, unquote, i.e. Russian egotism. And they dared to say it, despite what follows immediately on the pa next pages of Archipelago. How docilely, quote, 
kulak, unquote, lads were freezing to death under their barrows. One wonders, where were their eyes in 1933 when it was printed for the very first time? Why weren't they so indignant then? Let me repeat what I professed once to the Bolsheviks. One should be ashamed of hideosity, not when it is disclosed to the public, but when it is done. A particular conundrum exists with respect to the personality of Naftali Frankel, F-R-E-N-K-E-L, again a German Jew name, that tireless demon of archipelago, how to explain his strange return from, Trotsky, from Turkey in the 1920s. He successfully got away from Russia with all his capitals after the first harbingers of revolution. In Turkey, he attained a secure, rich, and unconstrained social standing, and he never harbored any communist ideas, and yet he returned. To come back and become a toy for the GPU and for Stalin, to spend several years in imprisonment himself, but in return to accomplish the most ruthless oppression of imprisoned engineers and the extermination of hundreds of thousands of the dekulakized, in quotes, dekulak, dekulakized, dekulakized. What could have motivated his insatiable evil heart? I am unable to imagine any possible reason except vengeance toward Russia. If anyone can provide an alternative explanation, please do so, of why Naftali Frankel, rich and, and well-placed in Turkey, would come back to Russia and even end up getting imprisoned himself, all for the chance to kill hundreds of thousands of Russians. Judge Solzhenitsyn. What else could be revealed by someone with a thorough understanding of the structure of the camp command? The head of the first department of Bello Morstroy was one wolf, the head of the Dimitrov section of Volgo Canal was Bavshover. Bavshover. The finance division of Belomorstroy was headed by L. Berenzone. His deputies were A. Dorfman, the already mentioned Ingier, Lovetsky Kagner Angert, and how many of the other humbler posts remained unmentioned? Is it really unreasonable? Is it really reasonable to suppose that Jews were digging soil with shovels and racing their hand barrows and dying under those barrows from exhaustion and emaciation when they're running the show? Hell no. Well, view it as you wish. A.P. Skripnikova and D.P. Vitkovsky, who were there, told me that Jews were overrepresented among idiots during construction of Bello Moor Canal, and they did not roll barrows and did not die under them, so they weren't doing the work. And you could find highly placed Jewish commanders not only at Bell Baltlag, construction of the Kotlis Vorkuta Railroad was headed by Moraz. His son married Svetlana Stalina. The special officer in charge of Gulag in the Far East was Grok. These are only a few of the names which resurfaced accidentally. If a former inmate, Thomas Segovio, an American national, didn't write to me, I wouldn't be aware I wouldn't be aware about the head of the Kai Urisink Mining Administration on Kolima between 1943 and 44, at the depths of the Patriotic War. Quote, Half Colonel Arm, ARM, was a tall black haired Jew with a terrible reputation. His orderly man was selling ethanol to everybody, 50 grams for 50 rubles. Arm had his own personal tutor of English, a young American arrested in Karelia. His wife was paid a salary for an accountant's position, but she didn't work. Her job was actually performed by an inmate in the office, a common practice revealing how families of Gulag commanders used to have additional incomes. Or take another case. During the age of Glasnost, that's when Russia came open after the fall of the wall, one Soviet newspaper published a story about the dreadful Gulag administration that built a tunnel between Sakhalin and the mainland. That's an island. Sakhalin and the, and the mainland. It was called the Trust of Ares, A-R-A-I-S. Who was that comrade Ares? I have no idea. But how many perished in his mines and in the unfinished tunnel? Sure, I knew a number of Jews. They were my friends who carried all the hardships of common labor. In Archipelago, I described a young man, Boris Gamarov, who quickly found his death in the camp. While his friend, the writer Ingal, I-N-G-A-L, was made an accountant from the very first day in the camp, although his knowledge of arithmetic was very poor, I knew Volodya Gershuni, an irreconcilable and incorruptible man. I knew Jog Mazamed, 
who did common labor in the hard camp at Ekebastuz on principle, though he was called up upon to join the idiots. But on principle, he took the common work. Besides, I would like to see here, I would like to list here a teacher, Tatiana Moiseevna, Moises' daughter, Moiseevna, Tatiana Moiseevna Falika, who spent 10 years drudging, she said, like a beast of burden. And I would also like to name here a geneticist, Vladimir Ephraim's son, who spent 13 out of his 36 months of imprisonment, one out of his two terms, doing common labor. He also did it on principle, though he also had better options. Relying on parcels from home, one cannot blame him for that, he picked the hand barrow precisely because there were many Jews from Moscow in that Jezkazgan camp, and they were used to settling well, while Ephraimson wanted to dispel any grudge toward Jews, which was naturally emerging among inmates. And what did his brigade think about his behavior? Quote, he is a black sheep among the Jews. Would a real Jew roll a barrow? He was similarly ridiculed by Jewish idiots who felt annoyed that he, quote, flaunted himself, unquote, to reproach them. In the same vein, another Jew, Jakov Davidovich Grodzinski, who also beavered in the common category, was judged by others. Is he really a Jew? It is so symbolic. Both Ephraimson and Grodzinski did those right and best things which could only be motivated by the noblest of Jewish appeals to honestly share the common lot, and they were not understood by either side. They are always difficult and derided, the paths of austerity and dedication, the only ones that can save humanity. Austerity and dedication, the only ones that can save humanity. I try not to overlook such examples because all my hopes depend on them. And here he's exactly like the Catholics. He's depending on the exception to prove there is no rule. Let's add here a valiant Gersh Keller one of the leaders of the Kengir uprising in 1954. He was 30 years old when executed. I also read about Yitzhak Kaganov, commander of an artillery squadron during the Soviet-German War. In 1948, he was sentenced to 25 years for Zionism. During seven years of imprisonment, he wrote 480 pieces of poetry in Hebrew, which he memorized without writing them down. During his third trial, July 10, 1978, after already serving two terms, Alexander Ginsburg was asked a question. What is your nationality? And replied, inmate. That was a worthy and serious response, and it angered the tribunal. But he deserved it for his work for the Russian Public Relief Fund, which provided assistance to families of political prisoners of all nationalities and by his manly vocation. This is what we are, a genuine breed of prisoners, regardless of nationality. However, my camps were different, spanning from the, quote, great Bellomore to the tiny 121st camp district of the 15th OLP of Moscow's UITLK, which left behind a not inconspicuous semicircular building at Kaluga's Gate in Moscow. Out there, our entire life was directed and trampled by three leading idiots, Solomon Solomonov, a chief accountant, David Burstein, first an educator, quote-unquote, and later a work-assigning clerk, and Isaac Bershader. Earlier, in exactly the same way, Solomonov and Bershader ruled over the camp at the Moscow Highway Institute, or MHI. Note that all this happened under the auspices of a Russian camp commander, one Ensign Mironov. All three of them came up before my eyes, and to get positions for them, in each case their Russian predecessors, were instantly removed from the posts. Solomonov was sent in first. He confidently seized a proper position and quickly got to the right side of the ensign, I think using food and money from the outside. Soon after that, the wretched Bershader was sent in from MHI with an accompanying note, quote, to use him only in the common labor category, a quite unusual situation for a domestic criminal, which probably meant substantial delinquency. He was about 50 years old, short, fat, with a baleful glare. He walked around, condescendingly inspecting our living quarters, with the look of a general from the head department. The senior proctor asked him, what is your specialty? Storekeeper. There is no such specialty. Well, I am a storekeeper. 
Anyway, you're going to work in the common labor brigade. For two days he was sent there. Shrugging his shoulders, he went out, and upon entering the work zone, he used to seat himself on a stone and rest respectably. The brigadier would have hit him, but he quailed. The newcomer was so self-confident that anyone could sense power behind him. The camp storekeeper, Sevastyanov, was depressed as well. For two years he was in charge of the combined provision and sundry store. He was firmly established and lived on good terms with the brass, but now he was chilled. Everything is already settled. Settled. Bershader is a, quote, storekeeper by specialty. Then the medical unit discharged Bershader from the labor duties on the grounds of, quote, poor health, and after that he rested in the living quarters. Meanwhile, he probably got something from the outside, and within less than a week, Sevastyanov was removed from his post, and Bershader was made storekeeper, with the assistance of Solomonov. However, at this point, it was found that the physical labor of pouring grain and rearranging boots, which was done by Sevastyanov single-handedly, was also contraindicated for Bershader. So he was given a henchman in Solomonov's bookkeeping office and enlisted the latter as service personnel. But it was still not a sufficiently abundant life. The best-looking, proudest woman of the camp, the swan-like Lieutenant Sniper M, was bent to his will and forced to visit him in his storeroom in the evenings. After Burstein showed himself in the camp, he arranged to have another camp beauty, A.S., come to his cubicle. Is it difficult to read this? But they were by no means troubled how it looked from the outside. It even seemed as if they thickened the impression on purpose. They lorded it over the non-Jews. And how many such little camps with similar establishments were there all across the archipelago? And did Russian idiots behave in the same way, unrestrained and insanely? Yes, but within every other nation it was perceived socially like an eternal strain between rich and poor, lord and servant. However, when an alien emerges as a, quote, master over life and death, it further adds to the heavy resentment. It might appear strange. Isn't it all the same for a worthless, negligible, crushed, and doomed camp dweller surviving at one of his dying stages? Isn't it all the same who exactly seizes the power inside the camp and celebrates crow's picnics over his trench grave? As it turns out, it is not. These things have been etched into my memory inerasably. In my play, Republic of Labor, I presented some of the events that happened in camp on Bolshaya Kalushskaya, understanding the impossibility of depicting everything like it was in reality because it would inevitably be considered as an incitement of anti-Jewish sentiment, as if that trio of Jews was not inflaming it in real life, caring little about consequences, I withheld the abominably greedy Bershader. I concealed Burstein. I recomposed the profiteer Rosa Kalikman into an amorphous Bella of Eastern origin and retained the only Jew accountant, Solomonov, exactly like he was in life. So he actually downplayed how bad Jews were in his literature. So what about my loyal Jewish friends after they perused the play? The play aroused extraordinarily passionate protests from V.L. Teusch. He read it not immediately, but when Sav Remenik had already decided to stage it in 1962, so the question was far from scholarly. The Toishes, T-E-U-S-H, were deeply injured by the figure of Solomonov. They thought it was dishonest and unjust to show such a Jew, despite that in the real life, in the camp, he was exactly as I showed him, in the age of oppression of the Jews. But then it appears to me that such age is everlasting. When have our Jews not been oppressed? Exactly. Toysh was alarmed and extremely agitated and put forward an ultimatum that if I did not remove it or at least soften up the image of Solomonov, then our friendship will be ruined and he and his wife will no longer be able to keep my manuscripts. Moreover, they prophesied that my very name will be irretrievably lost and blemished if I leave Solomonov in the play. Why not make him a Russian? They were astonished. Is it so important that he be a Jew? But if it doesn't matter... Why did Solomonov select Jews to be idiots? I took a chill pill. A sudden sensorial ban, no less weighty than the official Soviet prohibition, had emerged from an unanticipated direction from one of his thought friends. However, the situation was soon resolved by the official prohibition 
forbidding Sabra, uh, Sabra Menik to stage the piece. Again, it was 1962. And there was another objection from Toysh. Your Solomana, this is a direct quote, has anything but Jewish personality. A Jew always behaves discreetly, cautiously, suppliantly, even cunningly, but from where comes this pushy impudence of jubilant force? This is not true. It cannot happen like this. However, I remember not this Solomonov alone. However, I remember not this Solomonov alone, and it was exactly like that. Pushy Jews do exist. I saw many things in the 20s and 30s in Rostov on the Don, and Frankel acted similarly, according to the recollections of surviving engineers. Such a slip of a triumphant power into insolence and arrogance is the most repelling thing for those around. Sure, it is usually behavior of the worst and rudest, but this is what becomes imprinted in memory. Likewise, the Russian image is soiled by the obscenities of our villains. All these blandishments and appeals to avoid writing about things as they were are undistinguishable from what we heard from the highest Soviet tribunes about anti-defamation, about socialist realism, to write like it should be, not like it was. That's exactly what it defines an ideological media. That's what we have in the U.S., the mass media. They're trying to write it the way it's supposed to be, not the way it is. Black on white, black becomes white on black, etc., etc. To write like it should be, not like it was. As if a creator is capable of forgetting or creating his past anew. As if the full truth can be written in parts, including only what is pleasing, secure, and popular. And how meticulously all the Jewish characters in my books were analyzed with every personal feature weighed on an apothecary scale. That's an exceptionally sensitive pharmacy scale. Grams. But the astonishing story of Grigory M., who did not deliver the order to retreat to a dying regiment because he was frightened, was not noticed. It was passed over without a single word. And Ivan Denisovich added insult to injury. There were such sophisticated sufferers, but I put forward a boor. Last page. For instance, during Gorbachev's Glasnost, emboldened Asir Sandler published his camp memoirs, quote, after first perusal, I emphatically rejected one day in the life of Ivan Denisovich. The main personage was Ivan Denisovich, a man with minimal spiritual needs, focused only on his mundane troubles. And Solzhenitsyn turned him into the national image. Exactly like all well-meaning communists were grumbling at that time. While Solzhenitsyn preferred not to notice the true intelligentsia, the determinant of domestic culture and science, Sandler was discussing this with Myron Markovich, Etlis, both used to be idiots in medical unit, and Etlis added, quote, the story is significantly distorted, placed upside down. Solzhenitsyn failed to emphasize the intelligent part of our contingent. Self-centered reflections of Ivan Denisovich about himself, that patience, that pseudo-Christian attitude towards others. And in 1964, Sandler was lucky to relieve his feelings in conversation with Ehrenberg himself. And the latter affirmatively nodded. He was their propagandist, Ilya Ehrenberg, and the kill all the Germans guy. And the latter affirmatively nodded when Sandler mentioned his, quote, extremely negative feeling toward my novelette. However, not a single Jew reproached me that Ivan Denisovich, in essence, attends to Cesar Markovich as a servant, albeit with good feelings. That ends chapter 20, and this is recording 32. So, Jews get mad when you show them as they, when you portray them as they actually are, and Jews in the camps looked out for each other. There was a lot of nepotism, and they had the cushy positions, insofar as anything in a labor camp is cushy, but they did not share in the common labor with a couple of principled exceptions. There's your takeaway. Thanks for being with me today. And I'll be back with you again for more from Solzhenitsyn and 200 Years Together real, real soon.